Hi everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Uh, you sent us your cues and we're going to show you our A's on another Q&A special. So uh, joining me as always from the digital Pleroma, which is separate and legally distinct from the virtual Alexandria, is Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. <laughs> Aren't you glad we did that one again with the good joke about the virtual Alexandria? Hilarious. The two people who get it are going to laugh so hard. I think all of our viewers will get it. I th yeah. I think, uh, I think we have uh, <laughs> quite an overlap. Anyway, let's get right into the Q's and A's here. So um, we've got, you, you collected these questions from a number of sources, yeah? That's correct. Mostly from Reddit, but a few from our YouTube page. And looking at it now, I do realize that I messed up and that I didn't put people's screen names. But you know who you yeah. are, and we thank you for submitting your questions. Thank you, anonymous contributors. Yeah. Hey, everybody. It's Father Tony coming at you from the future. Uh, I am listening to this uh, now while I'm editing it, and I have noticed that several points during the episode the audio just disappears uh i did not know this was happening while it was recording uh and it's very sad um however it's not a lot there's not a lot missing and uh the the information's still good so uh we're putting it out anyway uh gaps and all um and uh as an added little bonus in the gaps i put in a cool little tune that you can groove out to while you're waiting for us to come back and nanner at you anyway uh i hope you like it and i hope that you don't uh, find the missing information too distracting but you know if you have more questions you can always submit them to us for our next talk gnosis q a special anywho uh that's enough for me back to the episode i hope you like it the q a special very nice all right so uh, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on how to actually transcend the Demiurge? That's an excellent question, Father yeah. Tony. Thanks, I asked uh, it myself. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that seems to be one that, that's pretty important for, uh, for Gnosticism. Uh, and I'm sure it's something that we're going to get into pretty deep, uh, especially with some of the f further questions that we have um, uh, on the sheet this morning. But um, to break it down simply, sort of as above, so below. We've talked on the the show many times, you know, is the Demiurge literal? Is the Demiurge symbolic? Is it both? Uh, does it matter? <laughs> um, so I think starting from a place of understanding the Demiurge as being sort of the egoic mind, the grasping mind, the controlling mind, that's us. just kind of working with that and then working with, working with your mind, uh, I think is an excellent way understanding is not exactly what you believe if you're more of a literal demiurge guy right mm -hmm. it's both so basically how to transcend the demiurge would be through meditation through contemplation through contemplative prayer uh and through doing good deeds because all those sort of get past the grasping, selfish, and controlling egoic mind. Uh, what do you think? I think you have a good point about the uh, literal slash figurative uh, dynamic. I think that um, a lot of things that we talk about when uh, in Gnosticism come down to, um, yeah, you can take the stuff literally or you can treat it as more mythopoetically, uh, but the, the journey's the same. Yeah. You know, um, I, I spend a lot of my time lately treating things pretty literally, um, but you know, like I can turn that on and off, kind of. <clears throat> so, yeah. the uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, about ascent. I think a few questions down here, but uh, I, I think one important aspect of a Gnostic transcendence is some kind of a ritual practice. Yep. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, uh, you know, the ancient Gnostics had something, 
right? They mm -hmm. obviously were practicing some kind of ritual ascent. Um, we, it's, in, it's all over all of their texts and the Sethians and the Valentinians and, and, and all the rest. So, um, and all throughout the ancient world. And, and uh, you know, if you'd like to, to bring me to your <laughs> your group to speak about it, I'm happy to do it for free for room and board and flight yeah. and whatnot. So, you know, um, anyway, uh, yeah. So I guess that's, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail uh, in a bit. Did we miss anything on that particular question? I think uh, I think that's good. It's always good to chat about the symbolic versus literal because, um, on the other hand, too, like how do you how do you understand these concepts that can't be understood by the rational mind, quote unquote, literally, anyways, right? Like, what does it even mean to say there's a literal demiurge? I don't believe the Gnostics believed in a physical snake lion being that lived in the sky. Well, and it depends on your yeah. definition of physical, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Good, <laughs> point. Like, Good point. So, you know, I, I hesitate to say, because I, I don't, I wasn't there and I didn't meet any of them, but like, I hesitate yeah. to say that the ancient Gnostics did or didn't take any of these things any particular way, right? Um, yes. It seems to me that, uh, if they did think of these things literally, and, and they very well might have, um, that they probably didn't think of them physically in the way that we think of things as physical. Um, there's a, <laughs> or like spiritual for that matter, there's a, there's a whole lot of fine distinctions between, you know, the physical soul substance and spiritual in a lot of, um, a lot of Gnostic systems. And so... When they talk about the demiurge and the archons and things, they're talking about largely soul substance, whatever. We don't really have a word for that because that's kind of been gone from from uh, from from the religious thought for a long time. But the whatever that soul substance is, they wouldn't have thought of it as physical because that's that belongs to matter and that's a whole separate category of something. So you can still think of it literally and not think of it as a being, exactly. It's very complicated stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. I'm glad well, we spent six total minutes on it. That, yes, that'll yeah, that'll solve it for everybody. I think that we solved that, so we can move on to the next question. <laughs> um, here, I'll read this one, and, uh, okay. and you can answer it. Okay. Uh, Once a Gnostic truly feels they've reached a point in their path of Gnosis, that they've broken free from the Demiurge and can transcend, why wouldn't they kill themselves to end this life and escape this false reality? Actually, good point. So just do that. Okay, moving on. <laughs> no, no j jokes aside, uh, what do you think about that question, Father? What's your answer? That comes up a lot, and, uh, and we've never really tackled it here, I don't think. Um, the... Okay, so two things. So, what, one uh, one of uh, Monsignor Jordan Stratford's quotes that I love, and I don't know if it's original to him or if he cribbed it from somebody else, but uh, he was in talking about reincarnation. Um, mm -hmm. He says, "I don't know if reincarnation is real or not, but I'm not waiting around to find out." Right? Yes. Like, so you do the work while you're here, and um, you know, and that's that. The how that's relevant is like it. If you think that you've transcended the demiurge, like, are you sure you've done enough work? <laughs> and yeah. is that a, are you just are you so certain that you're going to that you're ready to leave this physical plane? And is that even how it works? Um, yeah, yeah it, it's it's a it's a tricky one. Like you don't obviously, you know, we're not going to tell anybody to commit suicide. Um, I don't think. I mean, I can't yeah. envision a situation where we do that. Um, but yeah, it's my instinct is that once you've gotten to a point like that, um, it's part of that process. Then is to help the people who haven't. Yes. Um, and so, in order to do that, you probably need it'd probably be helpful to not be dead. Yes. You're here helping. I, I think that's I think that's exactly the answer, um, and that that's what I would say too. The other thing as well, and um, I mean th this is the Gnostic show of the two world hating duelists, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. But I 
I, I swing, I swing, I, uh, uh, I experiment with other cosmologies, um, and, and for, for those of us, which is quite a few... You keep some um, Valentinianism in your sock drawer? <laughs> you... <laughs> precisely, precisely. So, so, like any of us who have had sort of mystical experiences, right, we've, uh, oftentimes as Gnostics, we talk about sort of negative mystical experiences, where you've woken up at 3 a.m. terrified because you realize that, that there's something wrong with the world, yeah. right? That's mm -hmm. often the first step in the path of Gnosis. But we, we many of us, um, and probably many listeners and watchers, have had mystical experiences where they feel that everything is all right and God is present and alive in the universe and everything around you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And sort of in that, that Gnostic sense, the Pleroma is, in, is here and God is here, maybe trapped in matter, but the divine is here, yes. right? In right. some magical sense. So I, I'm assuming when you've reached a certain point of Gnosis, you have one foot in the Pleroma. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to kill yourself because you've transcended the Demiurge even if you're here on Earth. Like you exactly, brought right. heaven, you brought heaven to earth. Like you why, see the kingdom like, of heaven manifest where it has always been, spread over the whole of the earth. Precisely. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and and I have my doubts too about um, one of the reasons I'm a Gnostic and not a Buddhist <laughs> um, is 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 this sort of idea of sort of perfect enlightenment, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how how far we can reach uh, in in our existence. Um, and that's sort of the negative thing, though, as I didn't say in this lifetime, <laughs> um, in our existence period, right. but uh, particularly in, in our life on Earth. Now, I definitely think that we can we can become holier people, that we can become more attuned people, that we can sort of make progress on a spiritual path, um, and, and we can, as you said, we can see the kingdom of heaven here here on Earth. But I don't know I don't know how far this this path for perfection can can possibly go. But hopefully hopefully we'll find out. Yes, yes, indeed. Coming soon to a dark cave near you. Yes. <laughs> Jonathan, what strategies do you use to keep your mind at peace? Um, as you can probably guess from my answers to the, to the first question, uh, uh, meditation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the sort of simple uh, breath meditation or the body scan. Um, also, um, uh, centering prayer, which is, you know, a form of Christian contemplative practice that, uh, that you've discussed here on the network. Um, and it's also in your book. Um, you know, centering prayer really is sort of a form of contemplation or meditation. Uh, I, my theory is it's, it was called prayer because it was sort of put together by Catholic monks in the 60s and they have to call it prayer so that the Vatican wouldn't get mad at them. <laughs> really, it's, it's quite similar to a lot of, of meditation styles. So, so yeah, those two things. And, and of course, more, I, I don't even want to say conventional because, you know, I feel prayer is quite strong and holy right but you sort of dialogue prayer you know <laughs> yeah, yeah um so baby so jesus prayer, please give me a sports car kind of thing precisely yeah. yes so so um uh, the prayer uh i'll call it centering practice uh meditation and then um uh yeah so those are the big three for me how, how about you i i have boring answers i mean despite the fact that i did as you mentioned write a whole book about it Sanctuary of the Sacred Flame, a guide to Jonahite spiritual practice available now on Amazon.com. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the practices I end up doing daily are more, um, I guess you'd say secular. I mean, I do a couple of things like one of my favorite and one of my longest practices is that the, I, I called it the roadside cross practice. I, I wrote a blog post about it um, some sure. years back where you know how you see those memorials on the side of the road where somebody died? <laughs> of course. So I just, whenever I see one of those, I do a quick Jesus prayer. And what that does is that kind of refocuses me and says, hey, you know, you might be driving down the highway and you might be stuck in traffic, you might be whatever. Um, but remember that this is more important, you know? Yeah. So I do that. Um, and then a lot of what I end up doing are just little awareness practices throughout the day. Um, yeah. I find when I look at my watch or look at my phone to see what time it is, I find that most of the time I do that, it's pointless, right? Because I'm because knowing the time isn't going to change anything about the way that I live my life for yes. the most part, right? And so um, whenever I catch myself doing that and I say, oh, I've just done something that's not, that's pointless, right? Like I've, I've just checked my watch and I have no need to, at this particular moment to know what time it is. Um, then I that triggers a little thing in my brain that I've kind of just practiced and you know like okay 
I've done a useless thing. Now I have to focus on something important for, you know, like a couple of minutes. And that's usually some form of prayer or something. Um, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I get a lot of little things like that. Like for a long time when I was walking through a doorway, I was, you know, doing that little kind of check-in thing. I was going to mention that one. That's a Gurdjie thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it is or not. I've seen it in relation to um, training yourself for lucid dreaming. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen it in a couple of different places uh, for that purpose. I think Lon Milo Duquette uh, mentions it in one of his books and, and, uh, and something else. So um, for those of you who are interested in doing that, and I've never really had any success with it, but uh, I, I do know people who have, that whenever you're walking through a doorway, you, you can either just do it mentally or actually physically touch the door jam, the frame, and, uh, and you, you ask yourself, am I dreaming? Right? Yeah. And if you do that enough times when you're awake so that it becomes a habit. Um, if you go through a doorway when you're asleep in a dream and you do that at, out of habit, then you can say, oh, yes, actually, I am dreaming. So now I can start controlling the dream and, ha and have a lucid dream. Um, right. Yeah, I don't, I don't use it for that. I use it for like that same kind of mental check-in. Yeah. And, um, you know, Varying, <laughs> varying degrees of success, as with most things, you know. And I certainly can't claim to be a super chill person one hundred percent of the time, but you know that's what that's why it's called practice and not <laughs> success, I guess. Yeah, same here. Oh, two more things uh, I forgot about. Well, sort of touched on, but the uh, uh, the O and I Daily Office is is out now. So, right. um, and I, I really like doing the Daily Office, though I've struggled with it now since I was in college, just to uh, to to have the practice of doing it at least three times a day. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping, and I was actually doing some beta testing for the O and I Daily Office, which I which I was doing, and then I fell out of the habit yet again. Yeah. So I have my copy, so I'm hoping to to pick it back up. Um, you know, I'm fortunate in that, you know, I do have to do So it's not like I have to like, you know, get up in the middle of the office and find a quiet uh, uh, place to pray. So, right. um, so, so wish me luck, folks. Um, and sort of similar to the, to the doorway exercise, there's a simple one, which is, which brings some peace of mind that is, is good practice, uh, which is just, uh, right now, what am I aware of? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll say that to to myself, you know, when I'm riding on the bus or if I'm in a stressful situation, and it, it's just a way to sort of check in with the self, you know, and uh, sometimes have some distance too, because uh, you know that simple phrase can allow you to sort of take a step back from your thoughts and just feel the sinking, right? Yeah. So you usually start with exterior phenomenon, you ask yourself the question a few more times, and then you you know, right now I am aware of being worried. You kind of bring it internal and you can do it relatively quickly and, you know, obviously out in public. So, so that's a good in two and sort of similar to the doorway one. Yeah. 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 Um, I have, I, I have gone so far with the, uh, the, the divine office to take the book out and put it on my bedside table. So yeah. that's step one. Um, yeah. I think it's an important step and I think I've spent a lot of, mental and emotional energy doing that uh and maybe someday i'll open it i think that i you know i have goals yeah it's important to have goals um <laughs> i should mention that um if you are interested in that not you John, uh, pretty much all of the uh joe and i parishes uh, have a whole bunch of copies so um if you live near one then it's time to stop in and say hello, and uh, and maybe if they like you, they'll give you one. Uh, or there's a PDF version floating around somewhere that uh, maybe someone can get. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm very helpful. You know? Yes, but if it's something you're interested in, ask and somebody will help you. With yeah, that. exactly. Uh, Facebook yeah. is a good place to ask, the, the Joe and I Facebook group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I better ask this next question to yeah, you. Uh, Father Tony, is ascension a mental process or a physical process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There we go. <laughs> to, uh, to, to elaborate, I suppose, um, the, the concept of ascension is complicated, uh, obviously. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the 
the ancient Gnostics were almost certainly practicing some form of ascent, or, you know, ritual ascent practice. The idea being that as a Gnostic, you, your entire goal is to transcend the limitations of the physical and the soul substance and become a fully realized spiritual being, right? Um, and the way that they were doing that was by performing these rituals to overcome the various obstacles uh, as somebody ascended through the spheres uh, as the ancient Gnostic cosmology had it, you know, like, like an onion of concentric layers of, uh, of uh, planetary influences and things like that um, yeah. to the Pleroma and then ultimately to the uh, invisible father in the Sethian cosmology. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of schools of thought on, on how this was done, whether it was before death or after death that these things occurred. Um, there are a lot of traditions that uh, explicitly have it as an after death experience. There's the, the, um, toll house ortho the Orthodox Toll House uh, uh, heresy, <laughs> or, quote unquote, um, that is... Uh, not entirely unpopular even today in the in the Eastern Orthodox Church, that um, the soul once you die, the soul will transcend. Will tra uh, not transcend exactly, but will move along this path in the actual sky, like in the physical sky. Will move along this path and encounter demons at these toll houses along the way, um, and that each demon will like kind of hold you accountable for your sins. And then um, if they can, if, the, if, if you're not sufficiently contrite or if your sins are too heavy, they will drag you down to hell. Travel through the underworld and would meet with a bunch of obstacles where you would be asked about your various sins and then at the end your heart would be weighed against the feather of Ma'at and if you're if you uh, had any unrepentant sins your your heart would be heavier and it would be eaten by a pig crocodile hippopotamus <laughs> I mean, like, that's the world that the Gnostics lived in, right? Where that was yes. known. Like, that was, that, was, that was old, old, old stuff by the time the Gnostics were kicking around in the desert uh, some 2,000 years ago. So, built on it, right? So that's, um, as far as, uh, again, the distinction between physical and soul substance and spirit, I don't think that you're actually talking about the body physically going anywhere. So yeah. uh, I think that you're, we're talking about, um, we're talking about something that happens pretty much exclusively in the realm of soul in that way, uh, depending on where you draw those lines. And um, your soul is becoming uh, purified or aligned. You know how if you take two polarized lenses and you kind of like turn them uh, and like, if they're 90 degrees from each other, they're opaque, but if they're lined up, they're transparent. So I, I, that's kind of how I view, when I think of this in my brain, that's how I view the soul. Like yeah. the soul before all this work is opaque, they're, the light can't come through, the spirit can't shine through, and then as you align them. <laughs> you know, in unity with the divine and you get to kind of experience that as we were talking about earlier. Yes. Yeah. So, so again, I, I mean, this person said, is it, is it a, a physical or mental process? I, I think maybe they meant a, a, perhaps more of a literal or mental process. Maybe they meant physical that you would, that your body would rise up. Okay, yeah. Um, but, but again, I, I think it's sort of like the answer to the first question where it works either way, right? Because you are, you're doing these, these prayers, meditations, and importantly, rituals. So that's sort of a, a literal thing, a physical thing, this ritual part. But um, like what is 
what is actually happening? Is it is it symbolic? Are you doing internal work? Are these forces that are inside of you? And I would argue it, it works either way, right? Because the Gnostics would have said that that these negative archonic But even if you are using this mythological view or believe it in a more literal sense, it's you're still doing internal work, right? Because these are things that have been placed within your, uh, layered on top of your soul uh, by the Archons. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly it. I, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, there's, there's no, there's no separation. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, as above, so below and... You, you've got to do the work whether you think of it as you know your your soul is literally traveling outside your body or you're just kind of thinking really strongly about it either way <laughs> yeah even if it's a guided visualization yes yeah. uh, I, I always like to leave a little uh, wiggle room and people probably notice this on the show for these more symbolic psychological explanations right because yeah. that's often the way that we, we think in the modern world because we're modern people and I'm I not the saying world is so much more boring that way though I, mean, I <laughs> do too I do too I, I mean it's not it's not really my worldview but it's often it's often where I go because it's the language of now yeah. you know what I mean yeah. Like and and I think it's helpful sometimes because that is the language and worldview that we have to think in those ways. Even though ultimately, I, I think you may want to leave that thinking behind. And sometimes you do when you get to a certain point. And, and you're right. Like I'm I'm all about even though I often reach for these these symbolic and psychological explanations. Um, and sometimes it's definitely a reach. I I, I think it. You know I I I'm a big fan of reenchantment. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like you, I want to see magic come back into the world and into our explanations and to have that mystery. So, yeah. a yeah. big influence on my thinking lately has been the uh, Gordon White's work. Um, mm -hmm. And again, if you if you watch the show, then you probably know who Gordon yeah. White is. But if not, he it's look. time time for another shot. It's him and, and April DeConnick. So yeah, when, when, exactly. when you poke their names, there's your your prognosis drinking game. Exactly. Everybody take a shot of you know your favorite pleuromic liquid um yeah so uh, you know he he talks a lot about animism um in a in a magical context but i, I think animism is is pretty much a perfect uh worldview for gnosticism as well yeah um, so that's uh that's uh, here's another plug for you know gordon and the rune soup podcast if you're not listening to that go, go do it and gordon come on the show would you come on the show gordon. I've, been, I've been tweeting at you yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so I guess this one's mine. Um, I was recently playing a Japanese role-playing game called Persona 5 that involved a battle against Yeldabaoth. What's the weirdest place you have ever seen overt Gnostic references? Well, I'm no great gamer, and I don't know what a Persona 5 is, but that that's pretty cool. That That's a good find. But I, I will answer, actually, one of the, the places that really surprised me was a long time ago, probably back in the Halcyon days of 1997 or 1998, and it was playing uh, Final Fantasy VII yeah. for the PlayStation 1. Yeah, a very, very Gnostic game that not, not only had kind of randomly borrows names, like Yalda Bay Off, I don't know how how Gnostic that game actually is, the plot line. But the plot line for Final Fantasy VII is quite Gnostic, and it's obviously deliberately so. Like, they picked, they read something from the Akamati. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it has ideas about false deities and entrapped humans, uh, false realities. Um, and, yeah, so it, it's a very, very, very Gnostic game. And I remember playing it because, you know, uh, I was no great Gnostic scholar, and I, I still am not, but I, I was up on it enough to sort of immediately get the references, and it was sort of blowing my mind. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was pretty nifty. Um, and you, Father? Yeah, can I say uh, Samuel Aeon Weir's uh, The Gnostic Movement? Because that's pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, that's not my actual answer. I mean, my actual answer is probably <laughs> yes. No, we can edit that in later. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, no. But um, <clears throat> probably uh, uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, I think, was the, oh, the, yeah. the weirdest place that I've ever, like, found overtly Gnostic stuff. Because there's nothing, I mean, other than, I mean, there's some Gnostic themes in that movie. And it's, yeah. and it's interesting to watch in that light. But, like, I don't think that's what uh the creator of that story actually intended in any way i i don't think anyway but oh i i looked it up he was he said he deliberately put in gnostic references he was oh, reading really? the at the time oh, yeah. all right well yeah. there you go 
Yeah, and and of course you do. I mean, you do have these sort of creators who, who directly, you know, do reference Gnosticism, and sometimes it's a very light reference. Yeah. Perhaps like this video game where they just borrowed the name. Uh, other times you do have these these heavy layers of symbolism because they've been reading or interacting with the works. But you know, sometimes and I don't think it's a read in. You will find works of art um, that that seem very Gnostic, and then you will find out that the creator knew nothing about Gnosticism. Right. Um, and that again, it might be a reach because us Gnostics are going to see it ever, anywhere. But of course, I would argue that it it bubbles up uh, particularly in art, uh, because number one, it's true, so <laughs> human beings are going to independently discover it, yes. um, and um, I mean, that's something that we really need to do a show on. There does seem to be a special relationship between Gnosticism and art, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I say art quite broadly everywhere, it's from, you know, music, painting, writing, so um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we killed that one. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd actually, I'd like to hear other people's answers to that oh, too. I think that'd be fun. So if that's you, really fun. Yeah, yeah. Comment on the video or on the podcast and the, you know, on the blog post. If you, if you do have a good answer to that, because I always love to see those. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please. And you were having, you, you were maintaining your list of Gnostic movies for a while too, right? Oh yeah. No, I've got that. It's yeah. like 40 something movies on it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, next one. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, why are you a Gnostic? You weren't raised as Gnostics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Almost nobody was raised as Gnostic. Um, I mean, uh, the Mandaeans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Mandaeans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, why are you a Gnostic, Jonathan? Um, an excellent question. So, obviously, it's, it's something I, I converted to, though... When you talk to a lot of Gnostics, you always have this, you often hear a line similar to, I never felt like it was a conversion. It felt like coming home. Right, right? yeah. I it always, wasn't something I, always... I decided to be. It was something I discovered I already was. Precisely. Yeah. So there's, I mean, you just answered it for me. <laughs> so oh, I, 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 no, it's good. No, it's good. Thank you. Um, because I think that's a great insight. It's just you discovered that's what you've always been. So you, you've had these, these intimations, um, um, these reactions to sort of religious stories, these experiences, and then when you actually discover Gnosticism, uh, it, it, the worldview, the mythology, the practices line up with what you've what you've already independently discovered. Yeah. So that that's my experience, and I think it's the experience of uh, a lot of people who have sort of become formerly religious Gnostics. Um, it's an excellent question because, you know, you, the, the AJC, the, the Gnostic Church that you and I are both members of, um, is is getting, you know, pretty big. Um, and I, I'm assuming that its members are going to have children or have more children. So mm -hmm. we may actually see that that second, second generation of, of, of Gnostics soon. Well, in fact, we are. You know, uh, one of our uh, parishioners here in Boston uh, has, has a young child that, um, that we baptized when she was born. And, you know, and... Yep. and uh, is now old enough to start asking, you know, complicated questions about uh, about the world, and and um, the 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 parents want to start doing some more religious education stuff, and yeah, yeah we don't have <laughs> we don't have anything really uh, aimed at children. We you know these are complicated concepts as, as most religious concepts are. Um, yeah, and so. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion happening around that right now. You know, um, how much do you, I don't want to say dumb it down, but like how much do you simplify Gnostic ideas uh, in order for them to be understandable to children? Or like how long, when do you start talking about these things? It's, it's a complicated problem that uh, yes. it's a good problem to, to have, but it's a, it's a new one for you know, a relatively young church, uh, you, you know, something that you have to, you know, we're, our church if, in this incarnation isn't even 20 years old. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. we uh, obviously, even if you were baptized at birth, you'd only really now start to wonder about <laughs> these kinds of things, right? Yeah. And it's in any serious way. So anyway, um, yeah, so no, nobody was, uh, nobody was really raised as a Gnostic in this current environment and you know and, and obviously my answer is similar to yours that you know it's it's just something i discovered that i was 
Um, I've told this story before, but you know, I've been doing this a long time and you probably haven't heard it. Not you, you. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that kind of triggered my Gnostic journey was the Da Vinci Code. Uh, yeah. That, you know, like I read it and the, I didn't, I didn't particularly care for the way that the Gnostics were depicted in that story, but it was enough to get me to look into it more. Um, I still will argue that the Da Vinci Code is a great book, even though all of the, all of the nonsense that it spawned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The movie wasn't well, great though. Yeah. I mean, there's some blessings there in that it brought, you know, I mean, it brought you to Gnosticism, probably other people too, uh, even if there, it was a, a bunch of, of nonsense uh, about the ancient Gnostics. It may have spurred some interest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. The uh, raising people as Gnostics. I mean, so our present incarnation of, of the church is only 20 years old, but of course it has older French roots, right? Yeah. Beginning of the 1800s mm -hmm. and then the later Dwinell churches. Those ran for a few generations. Like, I wonder. I wonder what they did about children, or did they just seek to converse or, or be open to? Because I guess they weren't really searching for converts to adults. Um, yeah, they, they had different focuses, too. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the Dwanel Church, I mean, we have, we, we do participate in the Dwanel lineage, but we're not really a church in the Dwanel style, right? Yeah. <laughs> For more on that, you can search for the Gnostic Restoration on the channel here. We've got a lot of stuff on it. Also, the Joe and I Church's um, YouTube channel has a has a good video on it as well. Yep. <clears throat> um, but the the Gnostic Church of Dwanell's era was a church of initiates, right? It was it was intended right. to be um, like a, a almost a magical lodge with churchy stuff in it. Um, so that's not really a thing that children do. So I don't, I right. don't know if they were, you know, were doing anything uh, for children. And as far as uh, Fabry Pelleprat's church in the early 1800s, um, you know, it was it was Templar. So I, I don't think that they were having any children carrying swords and walking up and down. Although actually, there isn't. Now that I mention that. Um, there's an account somewhere, there's a story of, uh, of a woman who, as a young girl, was baptized into Fabry Pelleprat's church. Oh. There's like a little, um, a little novella or an essay or something. I, I have it somewhere because I'm a digital hoarder and I collect everything. But yeah, yeah. so anyway, that'd be interesting to look at. Um, yeah. Yeah, dig it out and send it to me. Um, and I'll then totally I'm remember always... to do that. Yeah. Or we can put a link up because I'm sure it's in the public domain, so yeah. if it's online somewhere, so if other people are interested. Yeah, I also think, too, the sort of Valentinian model, like, I don't know, if I had kids and I want to raise them as Gnostics, I think I'd send them to, like, Sunday school in an Anglican church. Because then they have sort of, because we're sort of liturgical Gnostics, and they get sort of the liturgical stuff, mm -hmm. and then they get sort of the basic Bible training, and then as they get older, you can kind of be like, well, it, it, here's, you know, you got some, some good shit, but here's the good, good shit. Um, because uh, sort of in the Valentinian model, uh, it's thought that the Valentinians all went to church, right? Kind of your right. more... I mean, th this is this is a vast oversimplification, <laughs> and uh, I'm putting a normalization of Christianity way back where, where it wasn't happening, but they went to sort of your, your standard, you know, Sunday church, similar to standard, quote-unquote, churches now. Yeah. Um, and then the Valentinians would be like, oh, so you... You, you liked what you heard today in church. Like, would you like to come over? Like, some some of me and my friends, we're going to talk about what that really means. So they had these these <laughs> lodges outside of outside of the the churches where they would sort of build on on what they were learning and working through in it, but in a more gnostic sense. So yeah, they they pulled up their windowless panel vans outside the church and they like said, "Hey, psst, come here, come you." Here. You want some more? <laughs> you want some more? Hey, Get hey, want a little taste of gnosis? A little taste of gnosis? <laughs> first, first taste is free. So, so maybe something like that for for childhood education. Yeah, but, let's uh, just do that. Let's get let's get a bunch of vans. Okay, get a bunch of vans. Go park them outside Sunday schools. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is called a part of the show that we edit out. So we no, don't this get is gold. This is sand. All gold. Yeah. Uh, okay, moving on. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's probably a question you have never heard before in your entire uh, career as a Gnostic priest. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, if you guys are Gnostic priests, then why do you wear Roman collars? Well, well the short answer is because they're hella stylish. I mean, like, seriously. I mean. Yep. Um, no, that's not the short answer. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, like, as a, as Joanites, um, you, we're not more Gnostic than we are Christian, or we're not more Christian than we are Hermetic, or we're not more, you know, like, so like there's, it's a blending of traditions. It's not a, you know, like, we're not saying, there's a, you can certainly be a Gnostic and uh, be a Gnostic uh, a spiritual leader and not be a Roman Catholic style priest. That's, uh, you know, that's absolutely possible. Um, this is how we do it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we we participate in a, the broader Christian tradition and that's why we use those symbols and the sacraments of the the of the one holy catholic and apostolic church and 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 that kind of thing. Um So, I guess that's kind of the, the short answer is just that this particular mode, the the kind of small c catholic mode is the way that we choose to do it the, the the symbol set that we identify with for me it was a pretty easy transition because i grew up roman catholic and a lot of people in our church grew up roman catholic although it's not a requirement um yeah. but it makes a certain amount of sense um to just have you know like it's it's easier it's easy to recognize like this is what we're doing um yeah even though we have a different a different approach to it you know um <clears throat> we we talk about in in our church that you know in in the in the regular i would say the mainline catholic traditions the small c catholic traditions um the the priest acts as a mediator between the laity and god and in the gnostic traditions in the joanite church specifically um the gnostic priest serves as a facilitator right yeah Nobody's saying that in in our church or in any church that the priest is required for you to achieve gnosis and theosis and, and to ascend to the throne of the divine. Um, the, the function of the priesthood is to um, facilitate that, to help people on that path, um, yeah. not, to, not to be the gatekeeper, as it were. Yeah, and and to clarify too, um, uh, or, or if you agree, agree, it's also a uh, like like one reason why the AJC and, and some other Gnostic churches have sort of adopted this Catholic mode um, outside of the Catholic Church is because they they, they believe it to have power, right? Yeah, they believe sure. it to be practical and to like the sacraments like can help you on the path of Gnosis. Uh, having having a built-in church structure makes organization easier. Um, I've also said too, like just what you were saying, like we're we're not strict Gnostics. It's like something like the AJC is is a, a Gnostic, a Templar, a Hermetic, and an esoteric church, right? Yeah. Um, uh, drawing on everything from mystical Catholicism to the ancient Gnostics, and even though and, and these are things that are different and come from different time periods, and sometimes have clashing cosmologies, yeah. but at the same time, more or less work pretty well together. So we're not just creating something out of whole cloth that's completely wacky and contradictory. Uh, like, there is there is similarities between the ancient Gnostics and um, the great mystics of the Catholic Church. Yep. Um, uh, and also, I, I also, you know, again, not throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater, we don't become neo Cephians or neo Valentinians because why would we throw out the last 1,800 years of some of the good parts of Christianity? Right. Right. right and uh, yeah, like like there's there's lots of great and beautiful things in the last two thousand years of Christianity. There's definitely some terrible things, yeah. but hopefully we can leave some of that behind and and take the good. Um, and I know the AJC like we do have holy days for more modern saints, right? Uh, that the, the, that are in the Catholic Church as well. So by modern, I mean you know just eight hundred years ago. But right. Hilde Hildegard of Bingham. Um, do we have Saint Teresa on the church calendar? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and she's she's only like what seventeen hundreds or sixteen hundreds. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, exactly. All right, no yeah. institution is perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. yeah, you know, you, every uh, 
you know, institutions are made of people and people sometimes suck. So that's, yeah. that's something that you have to deal with. And in an organization that's as old as, or a movement, I guess you'd say that's as old as Christianity, you know, you're going to have a lot of good and bad. So, yeah, we, we try to, we try to take what's good and ignore what's bad as best we can. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. And hella stylish collars are one of the good parts, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to ask the last question? No, go ahead. I think this is the best one. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're all good ones, and thank you for submitting your questions and yeah. keep them coming. Um, I still am unclear on how a Gnostic views the world. Can a canyon or a sunset or an ancient tree just be beautiful without any thoughts of the world being a veil pulled over our eyes? Nope. <laughs> okay. No, no. Well, that was easy. Yeah, no, that's not true. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, that I mean, the 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 simple answer is sure. Why not? Right? Like nobody's saying that uh, you know, as that as a Gnostic, you have to just like hide in your room and pull down the shades and never talk to anybody <laughs> never have any fun and and never do any of that like the the world is the, the world has beauty in it um yes. and a lot of that beauty is natural and a lot of it is is created by humans um and there's nothing wrong with appreciating beauty for what it is um, yeah the uh the 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 problem happens when you fixate on it, I think. Yes. Um, that, you know, like, yeah, natural beauty, let's say, you know, absolute hardcore dualist, Sethian, you know, like the, a beautiful sunset was created by the Demiurge in order to keep us numb to the spiritual reality of, you know, of Gnosis and Theosis and all of that. Um, then great, enjoy the sunset, but then remember that you have other work to do also. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, there's, um, you know, like uh, the there's a, a phrase from the Gospel of Thomas, you know, whoever does not hate his fa mother and his father cannot enter the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people take that as like, oh, like we really have to just cut off from the world and, and you know, we're and have nothing to do with it and that's not what they're saying they're saying that the the important things are spiritual and the the rest of it is at at best a distraction um but yeah. at the same time nobody's achieving gnosis if they're starving to death so yeah. it's it's a balance like everything else so you know enjoy the sunset enjoy a good meal you know enjoy a nice rare steak um but then you know get back to work yeah yeah I, I completely agree too so i think you can definitely uh take pleasure in in worldly things but it is it is having that that not being caught up right yep. not being caught up in cycles of grasping not being caught up in cycles of delusion not mm -hmm. being caught up in cycles of addiction um and, and kind of going back to the to the first question too you know i'd also answer with that that sort of when you have that sort of mystical view of the world right where you can kind of take pleasure in the world in this sort of spiritual sense which which is something that a lot of christians of, of all denominations would have sort of watching right. a sunrise or a sunset right they even use um, your time of it because they get to say oh look at how great the creator is you know yeah <laughs> we we do have a we do have a little added barrier there that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, um, but but I think just having an understanding of that of the that pleuromic reality that sort of lies behind the physical things allows one to appreciate the physical things. Um, that's you know perhaps that's that's the less world hating dualist side of me, the less Sephian side, um, or even that sort of Manichaean understanding of uh, I'm really turning the audience on of my my nomenclature today, but the uh, you know that idea of God being stuck in everything, you mm -hmm. know, not just humans, right? There, there's a spark in everything. There's a crack in everything, letting the light in. So that sort of almost pantheist or panentheist understanding of this all participates in the divine reality. I think can definitely bring some beauty to the world for uh, for us Gnostics. Yeah. I, I've I've said it a number of times, and I'll repeat again a million times, like that, you know, it's 
world-hating dualism is an absolute, absolutely essential part of Gnosticism until it isn't. Yes, yes. You know, so like there's, and you know, the, and then I'll inevitably go on to, to talk about the, the, the pearl, right? And an oyster yep. doesn't create a pearl until it feels an irritant, right? There's a piece of sand in there that it doesn't like, so it creates this beautiful pearl around it in order to, um, you know, in order to kind of alleviate its its pain. Um, and and that's that's gnosis, right? Like the the realization that there is something wrong, that that you know, yes. like this is this world is not perfect and it's probably not created by an all benevolent perfect creator because children get leukemia. And yep. so um, you know, that irritant is what causes the quest to begin and that in through creating that pearl you achieve gnosis and so on and so forth but it wouldn't exist without the crappy world like if there was nothing to rebel against then there would be no need for it exactly exactly and also sort of to build on that um like you know the world the world sucks and it's a hard place so if you do get to like you know like in moments of pleasure don't shy away from them yeah. as i said don't get addicted or caught up in them but like like life is hard man mm -hmm. and like if you find some pleasure from a good meal or from the embrace of a lover or a canyon or a sunset like you know take a little refuge in that because something terrible is going to happen to you soon because yes, that absolutely. is the way of the world well no i mean there's no greater enemy to gnosis than comfortable mediocrity yes right? <laughs> excuse me like if everything's going okay and you don't have any major complaints, then you're never going to worry about anything. You're never going to have to think about, you know, how to how to get better and how to, you know, transcend this crappy world if your world isn't really that crappy. But it's not that great either. But it's, you know, um, yeah. you know, it's it's almost better to be miserable <laughs> than to be, you know, comfortably numb, as the saying goes. Yeah, I don't know why we don't have more goths. Like just following us, following Seriously. watching the show, interacting. I know. The show. Where are the we goths? really, we really have to do some golf outreach. I because, got some t-shirts uh, for you too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, now we're spinning for time. I think we're just about done. But for this last question, too, I mean, this is almost very obvious and sort of again building on what we're saying. But like, yeah, we can take pleasure in life. But like, some a few easy examples. Like, it's fun being drunk, right? But if you're drunk all the time, it will ruin your life. Yeah. Like having sex is fun but if you become a sex addict you will ruin your life and i think you know eating a hamburger is nice if you eat nothing but hamburgers you're going to die when you're 35. like th th these are very obvious examples that sort of build on exactly what we're talking about you can take some pleasure in life but if you get caught up if you get addicted to anything fall into this grasping addictive illusionary relationship of anything it can ruin your life yeah. so i think that's that's sort of an insight for gnostics where yes you can take some pleasure in your life but just be aware that one could get caught up and addicted to anything that's pleasurable that's true <laughs> that's yeah. right so anyway um so yeah thank you for everybody for submitting your questions uh that i think that's this was a great conversation please keep yeah, doing so uh and we'll do another one of these uh as until when we get a kind of when we get a batch of them we'll do another yeah. Q&A special. Uh, I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't say the opinions expressed, yada, 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 not any organization, yada, yada, yada. You know, you know the drill. <laughs> there so, definitely are opinions, people. <laughs> take them, <laughs> take them with, a, with, a, with, with a big, with, with a big dash of salt. Yeah, Just super, really, yeah. super salty. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Jonathan, for uh, putting together these questions and for being co-host. Okay, thank you, Father. All right, everybody who's watching along at home, we'll see you when we see you.